integrated environmental and health impact assessment. Francesco is an environmental epidemiologist uh, working on uh, the health effects of health pollution on the cardiorespiratory disease. It has been my boss for the last 20 years, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's really a pleasure. So please, Francesco. So, good morning. Thanks to Carla for introducing me. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, not only because it's a very nice place, nice view. Yes. And, uh, okay, we'll just, I'm sorry, we just need yeah. to, to wait for two, two minutes. We just got yeah, to, okay. to organize it before. We could oh, sorry. the link. Sorry. Um, yes. Uh, no, no, okay. by date. Okay, good morning again, <laughs> and uh, I was saying it's a pleasure for me to be, yeah, okay, uh, I was saying it's a pleasure for me to be here, not only because of the nice view uh, of the sea, nice surroundings, but also because it's a good opportunity to share with people uh, some scientific uh, issue, uh, discussion on, on some scientific issues, especially on health impact assessment and, uh, and, and the way to go. So my, my presentation, I, uh, I realize I have a lot of time, so this is, would be good because we can have a sort of interaction and, 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 and question and answer and, and maybe discussion. So in my, in my presentation, this is the outline. So I will have some historical notes on, on uh, where air pollution, where, where uh, health impact assessment is coming from, what, what are the current debates in, 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 in use. Uh, I have an example on, on waste. Um, I have examples on, on uh, air pollution and specifically some uh, health impact assessment that was conducted in, in Rome some time ago. So using this example, we might discuss about the application and we might discuss uh, uh, of the problems and uh, limitations and, and, and advantages. Um, one of the uh, uh, main issue I will cover uh, in this presentation is the following. What's the difference between an epidemiological investigation and health impact assessment? And, and this is critical because especially people coming from epidemiology, they think that health impact assessment is an epidemiological investigation. This is, it is not an epidemiological investigation. And we will see this during the course of, of, of the presentation. So I, th I think someone has already, probably Carla yesterday, uh, has already provided um, information regarding this slide and this definition. This is a WHO definition in 1999, and it's actually coming from the 
the, this quite important uh, Gothenburg consensus paper um, uh, where they, uh, WHO convened a meeting of uh, and a conference with uh, uh, many, several institutions uh, on health impact assessment to define that and, 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 and to have some guidelines on how to conduct um, health impact assessment. Um, it's important to know that it's a combination of procedures. So it's not, uh, uh, it's not a discipline. It's a combination of procedures, different procedures. And if you, if you Google health impact assessment, you have m maybe 20, 25 different recommendations on how to do that. So uh, it's, it's not very clear, and there is not one specific procedure. It's, it's a lot of, it's a, a combination of different uh, approaches, uh, methods and tools, but which a policy, a program, or a project may be judged as to its potential health effects on a population. And, uh, and this is also important, and the distribution of the health effect within the population. Why do you think they, 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 this is WHO decided to have this last sentence? You know, this is not only to evaluate the impact of the new program and projects on, on, or, or, or intervention on the old population, but also on the distribution of the effects on the population. What, what's the meaning of this? Can you, do you have an answer for this? Can you imagine? Uh, have you heard about this problem of inequality? Okay. So the question is, is this impact equal to all the population, or is this effect affecting more the poor people on people with more disadvantages or more vulnerable people? So in our uh, impact assessment, we don't uh, we want to know whether the, this procedure is affecting the population, but also if there are differences within the population. So if some specific subgroups suffer or gain most from this intervention. So this is quite important because this concept was not present before. So, and uh, this, that was uh, 1990. 1999, and then in, in, in the World Health Organization in 2016, so only two years ago, had a new um, guideline on how to perform and how to do health impact assessment. And from that guideline, I decided to, to take these this graphs, which I think are relevant. And, and the first graph is uh, from, from, from WHO, is to define the policy question with respect to the health, uh, to the to the the health effects related to the that specific exposure. So it's very important to define wh what is the policy questions and 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 uh, why this is important because sometimes the politicians they don't know what they want to do. So for instance, uh, a policy question can be. Uh, should I build a new plant for a new refinery plant in a specific area? What, what could be the health effects and the health impact of this new refinery plant? This is very, very simple policy question. You have a plant and, uh, and, uh, and, and you want to build, and, and the politicians and, and, you know, and, 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 and stakeholders want to build a refinery plant. But you can specify better this policy question. I want to build a refinery plant which is able to process such amount of uh, you know, crude oil. So you want to specify the size of the refinery plant. And, uh, and the size of the refinery plant may be different. You, 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 could, you may want to build a big one or you may build, uh, want to, to build a small one. So it's a different policy question. And uh, you may decide to use one specific process for refinery, or you may decide to, to have another specific process 
one which is more protecting the environment and the other which is not protecting the environment. So it's important to say, I want to build a new refinery plant which size is the following with, the, with specifically this uh, way of processing crude oil. So the, the policy question should be asked to the policy makers and to the proponent of, of, of the plan. And this is not trivial because we cannot respond to the policy question if the policy question is not well specified. Uh, so we have to plan the health impact assessment um, and, uh, and then start to respond to this question, uh, who is at risk, define the population and the geographical scope of that specific health impact assessment. So for instance, uh, uh, st uh, continuing on this refinery plant, uh, what do we want to, to, uh, uh, to, to do? To estimate the impact of this new refinery plant in, a, in an area of, let's decide, five kilometers from, from the plant. This is a good compromise because we think that the, uh, the emissions and the, and the concentration of pollutants will be affected only within a five kilometers um, radius from, from the plant. So we want to address the effect on the population living within five kilometers. That's a possibility. But you have somebody coming and saying, okay, you want to build a refinery plant, uh, that's a good uh, uh, work to be done, but what about uh, production of greenhouse gases? They don't stop at the five kilometers. So your question could be, should I do the health impact assessment for only for the local population, or should I do the health impact assessment also for a much larger population, which is the population affected from, from the greenhouse gases and, and you know, potentially climate change? Uh, uh, so it's important to describe the spatial resolution and, and what kind of pollutants I want to address. So for instance, uh, what kind of pollutants are coming out from a re refinery plant? Yes, you know, you're all experts of uh, this. Uh, you know, after, after a case the old presentation, we all know what kind of pollution. So uh, uh, question, is ozone coming from a refinery plant? Yes or no? No. Okay. Question. Is ozone concentration affected from the refinery plant? Yes. Okay. So you're good people. Very smart. So ozone is not a primary pollutant, but it's a secondary pollutant. Okay. It's a uh, question. Very simple. Is volatile organic compounds coming out from the refinery plant? Yes, of course. Uh, so you have all sorts of uh, possible volatile organic compounds, including benzene, including toluene, xylene, you know, all this sort of, of things. You have NO2, uh, NOx coming out. You have some small uh, amount of particles coming from refinery plants. You know, according to the process, you have many. So you have to decide what kind of pollutants should I decide to investigate? Uh, and you have to make a choice because you can decide to address the, the, prim the most important primary pollutants, which are the volatile organic compounds, but also you may think that also contamination from uh, uh, particles are important. And you may think that the formation of ozone compounds are important. So all this should be specified quite in advance. And uh, what are the health effects? And, and of course, you have to, to study a little bit. You know, if you, if you, are, if you want to do a health impact assessment, you cannot rely on your, uh, you know, uh, uh, a priori knowledge. You have to 
uh, evaluate what's, uh, what is the current literature on the potential health effects. So, for instance, I ask you, you are thinking of volatile uh, organic compounds. Uh, I don't know how many here ha have some medical backgrounds. How many of you are physicians or biologists? Okay. Quite a few. Okay. So, um, what kind of health outcomes can be related to volatile organic compounds? Benzene, for instance. Cancer. So, hemopoietic cancer, including leukemia, is one. What kind of other <coughs> pollutants? No, Isabella is very... Say, say again? Respiratory system. And what kind of effects of respiratory system? <coughs> Asthma has been suggested as, as being uh, related to volatile organic compounds. Okay, so if you are looking at uh, volatile organic compounds, uh, are you considering cardiovascular diseases in your health impact assessment? Probably not, because there is no link up to now, up to now, you never know, <laughs> uh, on volatile, on benzene and, and, and cardiovascular disease. So you're not evaluating uh, ischemic heart disease or, or myocardial infarction. But suppose a guy comes and say, okay, it's volatile co organic compound, but what about particles? You want to assess also particles. So what kind of health effects you should uh, evaluate? You have several others, okay? So it's very important to decide and make some priority list because you cannot do everything, of course. So you have to make a sort of priority of what kind of health effects you are going to identify. So now, now WHO says you, had, you have done all the uh, preparatory work, then you choose a model or a tool, and, and we will see there are several tools that are available for conducting this health impact assessment. Now, to conduct the uh, health impact assessment, you have to have here, as an input to the model, population data. We have already, Massimo has already covered this part. You have to have population data, air quality data, and baseline health data. Without this data, you cannot conduct the health impact assessment. So you want to know what's the spatial distribution of the population living nearby. Do you, suppose you want to address the issue of the, uh, uh, effect, the cancer effect of uh, benzene. And, and, and so the, 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 the guy provi providing, the, you know, the people providing the population data come to you and say, okay, we don't have the age distribution of the population living nearby. We, we only have the total population count. So we know that uh, around in, in, the, in the five kilometers radio, uh, there are 20,000 people living, but we don't have the age distribution. Uh, are you concerned about this? And why you are concerned? Of course you are concerned because benzene can cause leukemia, but you are concerned of childhood leukemia. So you want to have data a population data divided by age because you want to estimate the excess number of leukemia cases in the old population and in the children population. And why you want to address this different, in a different way? Can, can you, do you have an answer for this? Uh, why you want to estimate the number of leukemia cases in the nearby population, and you want to 
um, specify the number of childhood leukemia and the number of adult leukemia. Why do you think this is important? Maybe you know, maybe you don't know. I'll tell you. Is anyone having an idea? Please. Okay. So. Uh, maybe. Sport, who was? Who was talking? You? It's important to repeat because we have people uh, listen from the webinar. Uh, I mean uh, that um, leukemia concerned with uh, adult uh, results from longer term exposure to benzene, but uh, childhood leukemia may be concerned uh, to uh, short term exposure. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a very nice response, also because clarify that the time lag between the exposure and the disease in the case of leukemia is different in, in children and in, in adults. And we know this, you know, there was this uh, quite important experiment in, in science, which was the uh, atomic bomb in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, you know, this I call the scientific exp uh, experiment, natural. the natural experiment. So that, that the observation of the population showed that the lag time, the, the, the latency period between the explosion and the, and the childhood leukemia was much shorter than, than the, the time lag between the exposure and the adult leukemia. So, so the time lag is different. So if, if you have a new uh, exposure, you will see childhood leukemia sooner than adult leukemia, which will come later. Okay, so you want to address this in a different way. So you want, you, just going back, you want population data, if it is possible by age, by gender maybe. You want to have this wonderful way of doing the, uh, uh, the predicting the exposure of the population. You know, the case, the OG, uh, elegant and, and very, interesting presentation, so you want population exposure. And of course, you, you want to have health data. So you want to know what's the background uh, level of leukemia in the population, or what is the uh, natural, we call the natural background. So without that exposure, what kind, what kind of incidence rates do, do we have? So you have to have this, um, data, uh, so you see this, this graph is wrong, <laughs> because it says the, th the same thing t twice. <laughs> Difference between... No, the I, I think it's wrong, <laughs> so because it, it says you, you have to provide uh, input for the tool of health data, and it, it's just saying the same thing here. So. WHO is also wrong. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> okay. I think the difference is surveys, you have to be correct on the right. Okay. Okay. No, on the on the right side my right side, you have just the data of the population. So maybe the other one is more general, and the other, if you want really to focus on your, the, your case study. I don't know, I just have this interpretation. Yeah, okay, yes. But it's not very well described. I mean, if he, <laughs> three of us uh, <laughs> cannot reach a conclusion. <laughs> I mean, uh, I agree with you. The fact is that uh, what you need for uh, your uh, HIA is having three kind of data, and uh, on the right uh, you have uh, data that are baseline, uh, so a reference in some way. But uh, obviously, it uh, could have been said uh, different. 
I guess there is also a long test to explain this table. <laughs> we can go. And <laughs> okay. So, by the way, you need health data. Huh? You, you need health data for the population, either recorded or estimated. Um, this is something uh, I have to tell this story. I, I just went to Nigeria a few months ago, and the idea is to do health impact assessment uh, for different uh, sources of air pollutants in, in, in Lagos City. Lagos is a city of 18 million people, very high air pollution levels coming from different sources. Yeah, you can imagine traffic, you know, old vehicles, there is a, a huge hybrid there, there is burn, burning of waste, uh, there are electricity generators, diesel, so lots of different uh, sources. So, so the Ministry of Environment there is doing the source apportionment. So very nice part from the monitoring uh, side. And we decide, let's, le uh, uh, and the, the government is deciding new intervention, you know, to re especially to reduce the elect electricity generators, which are, you know, thousands and thousands and poll polluting. So the question was, okay, we should do a health impact assessment and see what is the result of this intervention. And so then we were asking, uh, what kind of health data do we have here to uh, use for the health impact assessment? And uh, this is probably true for all other countries in the world. So we were expecting to have mortality data and we, we got the response. Of course we have the mortality data, but only for people dying in the hospital. And we said, uh, what's the proportion of people dying in the hospital? So maybe 40%. And what about the others? Okay, you can die at home, of course. And what about the death certificate? Oh, we don't use that. And why do we don't use? We only use if people, where people dying have a legal, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know in English, uh, property succession. You know, you have to, you leave your house. Yeah, you leave, then you need the death certificate for this trans transaction. But if you don't have anything, for the culture of people, you should be buried in 24 hours. So for most of the population, you don't have the medical death certificate. And this is, this is widespread. So we, we realize that Nigeria have no mortality data. And say, how this is possible? We read on the WHO report, we have the mortality data from all over the world, including Nigeria. Who is providing this data? We went to WHO and, and they told us, you didn't read carefully the report. <laughs> Why? Because Nigeria is not reporting. And how can you provide this data? It's just imputing the data from other countries. So basically, it's an estimate of mortality coming from data nearby countries where they report the data. So in that specific case of Lagos, we don't have local data. We don't have national data. We have the WHO estimates there. And we don't know how far are those estimates from the real data. But if we are all around countries not declarating yeah. the, the data, Africa, we've got many. Many. So, yeah. I mean, if you can't take the country, and you can't take the country around, where do you take them? From France, maybe? Or? No, no. From, <laughs> there are countries in Africa reporting. So well, I'm not an expert, but this is, this is a problem in the world. You know, there, there, uh, you know WHO score the different countries, and there are countries completely no reporting, and there are countries reporting some data, and of course there are, there are, there are countries like France, they're very good. So there is a process of um, estimating the mortality data. So 
going back to the question of Masi Mustafa Jayad before, uh, we think that the health data are available uh, you know, worldwide. This is not true. You know, we have to rely on some specific places in some estimation. But, uh, you know, just going back to this Nigeria uh, example, um, so we said, okay, we don't have the mortality data, but do you, do you have any uh, data on incidents? You know, you can imagine in, in, in Africa and several places, incidents of uh, lower tract respiratory conditions is, is very frequent, especially in children, pneumonia in children. Do, we, uh, do you have data on pneumonia? In, in, in the population. Yes. And how do you have, because we regularly conduct a, a sort of health uh, interview survey. So in some years, not every year, but some year we go to the families on, on samples, on a sample of the population and we ask, in the last year, how many episodes of uh, you know, respiratory infection your child had and what kind of respiratory infection. So we, we have estimates of uh, pneumonia in children. So, so this is the paradox. So you don't have the mortality data, but you have quite good uh, morbidity data. So just to finish this. Uh, so you, you, you have this ingredient for, for making your cake, uh, uh, and then you run with population estimate of, of, of exposure, and uh, the, your exposure estimate, and then you use the concentration response function. This is something that we will see, I will present tomorrow. It's basically the dose response relating the pollutant that we are uh, considering to the health effects. So basically, if I want to estimate the, what is the potential impact of this the new refinery plan on childhood leukemia in the area, what kind of uh, health function should I take? Do, do, uh, do I have the health function from the local data? Probably not. So I should go in the scientific literature and see whether there is any systematic review, and probably Carla will, will speak about systematic review and meta-analysis, providing we, we have a number. What is this number? This number is just telling you what is the percentage increase of childhood leukemia in relation to exposure to benzene. So the, my problem is that I have to borrow this number from somewhere. And of course, if I borrow this number, I have a lot of problems. Because I'm not taking this number from the local population, I'm taking this number from the scientific literature. Okay? And we will speak about this. So I will estimate the impact and then after estimating the impact, I have uh, uh, a response to the policy question. And, uh, and then uh, when I provide a response, I have another question before going to the policy maker. And my question would be, what, the ba what about the uncertainty on my estimation? Okay, so and this is something uh, uh, Andrea Ranzi will speak about. So what is the uncertainty in what I'm doing? And where are the sources of uncertainties? We have sources of uncertainties here, the population data. Maybe they are coming from a census, so this means they have a very good quality. Maybe they are coming from estimation, so they are less uh, certain. Uh, the air quality data, maybe they are coming from some monitoring, so we have actual monitors, but if the refinery plant is not existing, we don't have monitored. So we have to borrow the data from somewhere. So, so there are uncertainties related to this aspect. And of course, suppose the, the example I was doing on using the 
incidence data of pneumonia in children from uh, Nigeria. They, this incident data are based on random sample of the population, so it's, it's a sample, it's not the old population, so they come with uncertainty. And let's go here, I have this concentration response function. Are we sure about this concentration response function? No, because it comes with, with uncertainty. So all these uncertainties will come up, and I have to tell to my policy makers, I'm estimating three more cases per year, you know, just giving a number, three more cases per year of leukemia in the nearby population. But these three new cases, they come, this estimation comes with uncertainty. And this uncertainty is such and such. So maybe from zero to six, or maybe from zero to 50. So I have to tell to the policy makers that I'm not sure, uh, how much I'm sure about my prediction. Okay. So let's see the current applications of this health impact assessment. Uh, we have several applications in, 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 the, in the last uh, 20, 25 years. The first one, which is an easy one, is the estimation of the burden of disease. And there is a nice example that we will see is the comparative risk assessment that the global burden of disease does. So it's comparing different risk factors and, and tell to the people what is the ranking of the risk factors in, uh, in, uh, in the world. So the global burden of disease comes with a, with a ranking where we, you have on the top, you know, tobacco smoking and, uh, um, you know, low physical activity, alcohol consumption, all the big risk factors. So you can do a comparative risk assessment you can do a scenario comparison, and the scenario comparison is very much the sample I was doing before. What's the effect uh, of a scenario where we have a refinery plant in that area in comparison to in, in, in a situation where we don't have the refinery plant? And, and of course, I can do, or we can do a cost-benefit analysis. So to do an evaluation what are the actual health costs on, on, uh, on, on the population, but what are the benefits of this intervention. So not only, not only uh, uh, you know, cost, health cost may be due to interventions, but also benefits. And, and, and I, I, I could uh, do a balance uh, between the two. Okay, this is the example of the global burden of disease. I think, Carla, has, you already uh, have shown this, maybe. Why I'm showing this? Because this is the first one. It was published in The Lancet in 2012, and, uh, and, and, well, and this is related to 2010, was ranking the various risk factors in, in the world uh, uh, responsible for the uh, total mortality. Uh, and you see high blood pressure is up there, but it is also in, in this graph, in, in, uh, also ambient air pollution was predicted as one of the most important uh, risk factors in, in the world. So why this is comparative risk assessment? Because I'm comparing, you know, various factors. This is a comparison of various factors. Um, this is an example coming from France, I think, um, uh, where the, the authors here in, the, in this publication, they uh, compare the actual legislation, the current legislation regarding the emission, versus a legislation with uh, maximum feasible reduction of emission. And, and you can see here, they did this comparison in, in Paris, in Paris suburbs and in a rural area uh, 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 of uh, nearby um, uh, Paris. And, and you see that uh, that's the effect of the current legislation, and this is the effect, uh, you know, decreasing the impact of the maximum 
feasibility, a maximum feasible reduction. So this is a, a scenario comparison. And uh, this is for the European Union. Um, when the European Union approved in 2013 the so-called um, air pollution package, which, which was a package to reduce the emission of, uh, uh, of pollutants in, in, uh, in Europe, they did the cost-benefit analysis of that specific policy, and this was published in, in, in 2013. It's just examples of application. Um, so, just reviewing the critical steps in, uh, in what I was uh, uh, presenting. So the critical steps are estimation of exposure, uh, something which I didn't uh, address, but it's, it's, it's quite uh, important. Um, it's, it's called the counterfactual value. This is, of course, not important when you are comparing to different scenarios. So if you are comparing a, a scenario where you have a new plant versus an, a, a, a known plant, you don't have a counterfactual, because the counterfactual is the, 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 that you are not building the new plant. Okay? But suppose you want to estimate the burden of disease. This is a question for you. So suppose your government asks you to estimate what's the burden of air pollution in your specific country. And your specific country comes with an average of PM 2.5, let's say of uh, 25 micrograms cubic meter of PM 2.5 and you have all the ingredients, you have the concentration response function, so you can easily estimate the impact of air pollution in your country. But your question would be, where I start to count the effect of air pollution? Which level? Should I start from zero? Because someone can tell you, we don't accept any air pollution level, so zero, is the maximum amount I would tolerate. This, let's see, this is the green Taliban, okay? So it's, uh, it's a very, uh, uh, very extremist uh, point of view. So zero. So, so you have someone ask, uh, responding to your question, we should start from zero. But you have someone saying, you know, you cannot start from zero because you have some natural background. So dust exists in nature. So you cannot arrive to zero concentration. You should arrive to some natural background. And so you have people saying, oh, the natural background, depending on their area, could be 2.5 micrograms cubic meter, maybe five, maybe in that specific area, maybe seven. So you have to decide which is the level you start counting the, 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 the impact. And then you have another guy saying, okay, you are speaking about the uh, natural background. But we have WHO saying that uh, in the air quality guidelines that 10 microgram cubic meter is the safe value. Why don't we start at 10 micrograms? So you have several options. And these options are called the counterfactual. So it's the situation where you don't have the, 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 the exposure you want to count as an effect. So you have to choose. You can choose zero, you can choose 2.5, you can choose five, you can choose 10. But each has a different uh, um, impact on your impact assessment, okay? So it's a big difference of starting at zero or starting at 10 because if you assume that air pollution has an effect for each 10 micrograms cubic meter of PM 2.5, you have an increase in mortality of, let's say, 6%, and your country has 25, one thing is estimating the difference between 25 and 10, which is 15, and another thing is estimating for all the range of the pollutants, which means from zero to 25. You see, it's a 6% difference, which is a lot in terms of, of mortality estimate. So is this clear? 
this counterfactual? So my question to you, if you have to, to do the health impact assessment, the burden of disease of air pollution in your country, uh, which counterfactual will, would you choose? Zero, 2.5, 5, or 10? This is not trivial. So let's open the, this discussion. What? Four. Okay, 4.2. Okay, why 4.2? Okay, so you, you, you have uh, a scientific uh, uh, explanation. What, what, what do you think? Should we start from zero or should we start from ten? If he wants to compare the burden of disease compared to other countries, maybe ten is accepted all around the world, so it can produce data that can be comparable in the other part of the world. If you want to calculate the maximal possible effects, I would say use zero as worst case scenario. So, okay, that's very good, very good response, I think. Is there any objection to this response? Done. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Accepted. Okay. Uh, so this is a review. Uh, we already have seen the, we need the uh, exposure response function and, and uh, I, I will explain long in, in, in a better way tomorrow morning. We have to report and, uh, and here is the question. What, what should I report? So some people are saying I should report number of excess death or premature death. Other people are saying I should <coughs> report cases of disease. Some people are reporting years of life lost. Others are reporting disability adjusted life year or change in life expectancy. So which one do you like? We had, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the last uh, 10 years, we had this very long discussion about these options. And uh, uh, the, when we are reporting uh, premature death, sometimes people uh, forgot to say premature death and just say air pollution is causing 4.2 million deaths worldwide and actually it's causing 4.2 million premature deaths worldwide. Why? Because people are saying, we, we are dying anyway. So, so what, what we are speaking about? We are speaking about anticipating the date of death. So it's, it's a message which is sometimes confusing people. So that's why people are using this years of life lost. But if I tell you, you know, air pollution is responsible of, uh, you know, 10 billion years of life lost, can you translate this information in something you understand? No. Even worse, if I say air pollution is ca causing 80 billion disability adjusted life years. So the main problem that we have in this communication of the impact is that this, these numbers are difficult to get. Sometimes people is using change in life expectancy. So it's saying, uh, um, okay, air pollution is causing in this country uh, uh, one year um, uh, shift in survival, which means that people are living one, as an average, one year left, or maybe six months uh, less. What do you think? Do you like this information? You know, time, uh, you are, uh, you are uh, surviving less time. 
What do you think? Is is better than number of, of death or is worse? What kind of information do you like? Yeah, sure. Uh, I Tell. <laughs> to see that, okay, you're all scientists or a scientist in Devonier, and uh, that's a question for you, but for us, that's a huge question, because, I mean, we can't, as, as you said, 80 billion years lost or something. We don't use it, because we don't know what it means. Oh, we can, because it makes big, ah, 80 billions, it must, must be important, you know. But that's a question we've got as a journalist, so if you, scientists, could just, you know, have a good answer, we'd be really happy. So, as a matter of fact, we don't have a clear response to this question. Uh, what is the best form of risk communication? So, nowadays, the, 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 there are two uh, most used numbers. is the number of premature deaths, because worldwide you, it is easy to communicate, but it is also misleading, because pe especially politicians always say, we should die sooner or later, so don't bother me. That's the usual response from the policy maker. And from the policy maker, if you say three million, so you say four million, it's the same. It's a big number, who cares? So we have problems in, in communicating here. Um, we have problems also in communicating this change in life expectancy. If you say air pollution is, is, is uh, 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 deprivating people of one year of life, Maybe it's good, but you know you have another tendency. You know the mes the main message that we get uh, is that people are living longer. So we have the message because of the uh, of the uh, better life condition, because of uh, uh, much more resources, because of the medical technologies, we live longer. And actually, the aging of the population is is one of the issue. So if you say, you know, this, this is causing you to live one year le uh, less, people say, I'm, I'm aging in any way, so, so wh why sh I should bother? I'm, I'm, I would be old enough. Instead of dying at 96, I will die 95. It's, it's basically the same. So all this communication of reports are causing problems in, in communications, and we're waiting for journalists to give us the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's my Say again? Sorry, um, I asked if, if you could put it in economic terms, because policymakers seem to be more interested in economic terms than they are in uh, environmental issues or in, in health issues. So if you could explain uh, the, you know, the, the decrease in productivity and things like that. I... Yes, but then my question is, how much you evaluate a life? Now, I was saying about how much do you evaluate a life because uh, I, I usually use the years of life lost or sometimes better the days of life lost for one year each year because for the years of life lost uh, you, for example, in Italy you consider the average uh, uh, life expect expectancy. So if you use the days of life lost uh, each year is... Um, probably you can compare also between different um, nation that has different life expectancy. This was uh, about the years of life lost, but usually the value that I found in some report that is now quite old is like the, um, uh, the cost of the productivity, like the um, GDP. 
that you give to a life. Uh, like uh, for the 2000 uh, for Europe, uh, it was uh, 50,000 uh, euros for each uh, year of life lost. Okay, so we have... Uh, yeah. to, to stress what Cara was saying, uh, two years ago we computed, estimated the cost of one year of air pollution in the case only of respiratory diseases, three billions, <laughs> so, which is 30% of the deficit of the health security in France, only for uh, the respirat what is uh, evident, because we know that inhalation is bad. If you remember yesterday, I showed the, the work Francesca and I, other people made with the American Thoracic Society, showing that the effect of air pollution are uh, beyond <laughs> the lung. They are many. So, and uh, we used the tangible costs. Um, we went to the social security, try with uh, through a, a, a tributal risk, uh, saying. Uh, 3% is due to, to pollution, uh, asthma cause that, BOPC, B, sorry, COPD, et cetera, et cetera. So this is uh, clearly an underestimation, but uh, I went to the Senate, to the Assembly, and et cetera. So I think uh, this is uh, really a, an argument of good for the journalists and also for the policy maker. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So uh, here I find it very interesting that we have a discussion here uh, saying, uh, journalists say, uh, please tell us how we should speak about that. Uh, scientists say, please, journalists, tell us how we should bring this to the news and to the people. And I think that uh, HIA are a very good uh, case study, I think, for what I think should become uh, the relation between science and society. Because you've, you've showed that at the beginning of the process, there is a political question that should be asked and tailored in the right way. And then yeah, the science comes in and uh, makes some uh, uh, assessment. And then a science brings the communication back, okay? And so I think all the process should be a discussion yeah. between politics or stakeholders, and I think politics is not the only stakeholders that should be in. And then we should find a way, uh, tailor the question, find the right solution, monitor the solution, and maybe uh, choose the, the, uh, the words we use and the way we communicate together so that everybody understands well and that finally we're credible, uh, salient, and, uh, um, and legitimate. Yeah, uh, I, and I agree, and this is really a scientific process. It's not the epidemiological one, but it's a scientific problem. We need the protocol, we need the policy question, we need a high a priori a hypothesis, we need the, a statistical plan, uh, everything needs to be standardized at the very beginning because once we would would like to to have is the result that can be can be replied somewhere else so it's a tool easy to implement i mean in in order to have the data of course but it's quite easy we will see this afternoon uh, an example a practical example because if you uh, have this standardization of the methods of the, the methodology at the beginning we can do the same in um, several countries and compare so Okay, so uh, I think we had uh, several good uh, inputs to this discussion. So we had the economical evaluation as, as a possibility. Uh, we had also the suggestion of uh, days of life lost within a year to make a comparison across various uh, risk factors and various areas. Uh, I think we, should, we had a very good suggestion that Health input assessment is something which is very much related to the, the policy questions and the way we respond to the policy questions. So, so it's, a, it's a communication uh, problem. Yeah, the, the, there's also other suggestion. Instead of reporting, you know, the crude number, to report the number as a percentage of, uh, you know, as in, in case of death, the percentage of total mortality, which is of course a way to to produce good information. As a as a matter of fact, WHO, in a, there's a very nice uh, website which is called Breath Life. 
is a WHO website for communication on the risk of air pollution, and uh, Breath Life, and is reporting the number uh, as one in 10 deaths is due to air pollution, or three out of four. So it's a kind of uh, percentage, but it's, uh, it's a, a very simple way of expressing the, the numbers. Okay, so uh, just to finish these slides, of course, evaluate the uncertainties involved in the process is part of the risk uh, communication. We have to report in some way uh, what is our level of confidence on the work we have done. So let, let's continue. And uh, I continue, when I say rewind, let's go back to the, to the hist historical development. And uh, I think uh, uh, Carla has already done this. Uh, uh, why I rewind starting from this? Because I start back from epidemiology. This is, uh, this is a, um, a very useful graph from epidemiology. In, in epidemiology, you have very nice uh, effect estimates. One is the relative risk, of course, and the other one is the attributable risk. So it's uh, uh, you know, year one, uh, uh, course one of epidemiology, relative risk, attributable risk. And so what we estimate is the incidence of disease in unexposed group versus the incidence of disease in exposed group, we make the difference and we say this is the attributable risk. This is very easy from the epidemiological perspective. And as a matter of fact, I, I really recommend you to go to this paper, which I think was, uh, I, I forgot this, was, was uh, in epidemiology in, maybe it's here, is in epidemiology in 2007 and it is an overview of methods for calculating the risk of disease. And I, I like very much this formula here. I always <laughs> present. So what is the attributable risk of attributable fraction among the exposed group? And, uh, and if you go to this part, uh, which is the relative risk, minus one, divided the relative risk. So if, if, I, if I ask you, Suppose you have a relative risk of 1.1, so 10% increase. So what is the attributable fraction in the exposed group? So it's very easy to do. 1.1 uh, minus 1 divided 1.1, which is basically almost 10% or maybe 9%. So it's very easy to say, if you have a relative risk of 1.1, so even a very small relative risk, in the exposed group, uh, the attributable fraction is 10%. So why I say to use this formula here instead of the one in the population? Because in the population, of course, you have to, to wait for the proportion of people exposed. But if in the population we are all exposed, then it's much easier. So suppose we are all exposed to air pollution, which cause a relative risk of 1.1. This means that the attributable fraction is, you know, 10%. So this is easy from the epidemiological perspective. What is not easy it's what Still and Armstrong already said in this paper. One of the issues is this relative risk, which is an issue of portability of the parameter. So usually we estimate the relative risk in the study population in epidemiology. So in, the, in the epidemiologic studies, it's very easy to estimate the attributable risk because we are deriving the relative risk from that population. But in health impact assessment, we are not using this relative risk in the same study population. We are exporting that re relative risk. And in, 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 we, we, we tend to say this is an issue of portability. I like this term because we transfer the information from one study, we transfer to another study. 
And this issue of portability is like the issue of the external validity in epidemiologic studies. So we find, for instance, that in our specific study, let's, let's think to the British doctor, you know, the famous study on, on British doctor assessing the relationship between smoking and, and lung cancer. You know, that study indicated that the relative risk was 10. You know, uh, 10, um, so 10 uh, fold difference between uh, those smoking and those without smoking. So the issue was, has been how portable is that relative risk? How we, can we generalize from the British doctor to the entire world population? And this is the same for health impact assessment. How can we generalize? And this is the, an issue of the concentration response function. So everything starts from epidemiology, but then from epidemiology, the, the, the U.S. Uh, government decided, so please. Just because we had some discussion during coffee, uh, if you go back, okay. Uh, you said now that how can, uh, what about the, the generalization of the results? The, but we are in the, in the opposite. We, we, are, we have to ask, we have to import another risk coming from another population. So the question will be how is generable to mine population? No, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm uh, correct, because yeah. I'm using data uh, collected in other populations so relatively is coming from, no, 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 I mean, if I don't have my own big cohort available. So that's, that's the way. So if I can choose what, in your opinion, will be the best, starting from proximity, <laughs> if starting from uh, uh, which is more available, maybe it's from Groenland and I live in, in Iran? I, I have a solution for this tomorrow. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, just, uh, um, I have a solution for this, uh, you know, uh, uh, per, per, partial solution. But just to, to, to address in, in more um, specific terms this problem of portability, because, uh, you know, you will see, in, in, uh, and you have read about this, uh, global estimates of, uh, you know, the impact of air pollution worldwide. And this is, these are based on studies conducted in, in uh, Europe and North America. So when we... As WHO, we presented these results to, to some countries like India. They may say, oh, you are using relative risk coming from Europe and North America. Uh, how can you be sure that these relative risks are applicable to our population? So it's a problem of adaptation of the relative risk to a specific population because you have you know, you may have racial differences. Uh, for instance, you know, you probably know that the Japanese have a different relationship between smoking and lung cancer than, than uh, Caucasian people, you know. So people from India may say, you know, the relative risk you are importing here from, from you know, you, you, you are making a trade, you're importing your American relative risk to, to, to India, and this is not appropriate. And this is something we have to discuss. But suppose you go to Doha, or you go to Dubai, and you are predicting uh, the air pollution health impact in, uh, in Kuwait, or uh, you know, one of the South Arabian uh, countries. And you say, according to my calculation, these are relative risks coming from, uh, from uh, uh, Europe and North America, but we are using you know, the satellite estimation of air pollution in your country, indicating that the uh, PM 2.5 concentration is you know, so high. And the guy comes and says, you know, our PM 2.5 is 40% from anthropogenic sources and 60% from desert dust. So you are taking the relative risk that comes from studies on PM from anthropogenic dust on the assumption that anthropogenic dust and desert dust have the same toxicity. 
Can you prove this? Because if you cannot prove, your estimation is completely wrong. So, what would you vote? For the Dubai person or for, from, for the European expert? The Dubai. <laughs> you know, the Dubai person may be right because we are exporting or importing a relative risk which is based on studies conducted with some specific condition. So the population is different, but also the exposure may be different. So this is one important assumption in, in this portability issue. And this is, of course, for all the health impact assessment, because one of the main problem we have is this portability. And, and of course, health impact assessment is very much linked to this portability, because the, without this portability, we don't do the health impact assessment. OK, this was very strange for, for the Americans, because in, this is an editorial that came in, in, in the American Journal of Epidemiology in 1998, so before, one year before the, the World Health Organization uh, statement on, on uh, um, health impact assessment. And this is called the Red Book, because the EPA in the United States decided to have an instrument for doing the health impact assessment and with the risk assessment. At that period, John Summit says, while epidemiologists and epidemiology data may have prominent roles in this field, the EPI literature contains surprisingly few discussion on risk assessment. So risk assessment and health impact assessment was basically conceived away from epidemiology and as a matter of fact, epidemiology was out of this discussion because it was very much based on toxicology. You may know that risk assessment, that we use risk assessment and health impact assessment, and maybe Carla has been already speaking regarding this in a, in a, in a, in a sort of, uh, you know, in the same way, but basically risk assessment was born in the toxicology lab. So it was a way to extrapolate from animal studies to humans. Okay, so, and, and we rely that people are relying a lot on, on the toxicology. So question to you. We said that the human, uh, the portability is one of the issue of health impact assessment. And my question to you, do you think that uh, portability is also an issue of the toxicology assessment? Of course. So this portability is not only a problem of uh, uh, human studies, it's also a problem of uh, animal studies, because what we had in the past was very much based on, on toxicological approaches. Um, so uh, what, what Summit is saying at that period Epidemiologists, look, you have to deal with this risk assessment because up to now, this has been the field of toxicology, but we have a lot from the epidemiologic experience to learn and, and, to, and to implement in this part. And this is quite important because this red book had this paradigm of dif different steps in the, in the risk assessment. Was, was, one was the hazard identification, the dose response assessment, the exposure assessment, and the risk characterization. It's a different order. We, nowadays, we, we see the exposure assessment before the, the dose response, but it's basically the, the same. So, uh, so uh, what Summit is, is saying here, we want the uh, participation of epidemiologists, so we want the participation of human data. Um, but it's, uh, it's very clear that epidemiologists are not well prepared to this field. So that's why we are very much advocating the role of a, a, a epidemiology here. Um, okay, I'll skip here. So let's go to this discussion of uh, um, uh, health impact assessment. Uh, of course, this, we already this, uh, said this. 
it's important to say that uh, although health impact assessment is done within the health area, especially non-health people are very much interested in, in this because they are the proponent of the, of the new um, project. Uh, uh, this is something uh, we already said, so planning a new motorway in this case. Um, uh, when we are assessing, um, this is quite important, when we are assessing the new project, uh, we are not assessing only one specific exposure. So, suppose you are uh, evaluating a new motorway. It's not only the problem of air pollution, but we have also other specific factors like noise, or light pollution of accidents, you know, several different uh, um, uh, parts. And, uh, and especially people might be interested in this physical pollutants, but people might be interested in this could be much more important. How this motorway will affect business. And, uh, and, and sometimes, if we respond to our mission of health impact assessment only with uh, uh, a response regarding uh, the health impact, but without considering other socio-economical part, this would be seen as only a partial response. You know, for instance, I have a story here, um, just to make it clear. So in, 90, in, in 2005, we had a new law in, uh, in Italy that we called the smoking ban. So this was uh, applied in, in several countries in, in Europe, but Scotland was the first, and believe it or not, Italy was the second. Believe it or not. So this law, law was approved and I, I have to say, this was approved during the Berlusconi government, believe it or not. <laughs> was prepared by the other government, but the Berlusconi government was the, 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 the first one who signed this law. The law was a 2003 law and said that in 2005, the, the law had to uh, be under operation. So there was a specific day, which was uh, January 10. I think, or 2005. So it was one day shift, smoking ban, everywhere. All the coffees and restaurants and so on. So a few months before, people were just questioning and how this law could be, you know, could, what, what could be the compliance of this law in Italy? Could, what, what, what do you believe? This, would, this law would be a complete disaster because no one would obey this law. You know, how can you imagine that Italians would follow these uh, prescriptions? This is complete nonsense. And, uh, and we were wrong. Why we were wrong? Because we were not considering this part, the business part. So owners of the restaurants and, and the coffee shops they were, at the beginning, they were protesting. They were saying, no, this is, we ruin our business. We want smoking inside because uh, it's, uh, uh, we'll, uh, you know, guests of, uh, of, of the restaurants will go away. But then they realized a few days after that if you have smoking prohibited inside, you have several people smoking outside. And if you have several people smoking outside, you make a crowd close to the, to the, to, to, to the restaurants or to the coffee. And if you have a crowd close to the coffee, you attract people. You know, especially Italians are very attractive when they see a crowd. So let's go there because there's a lot of people there. It should be good. So this was, you know, believe me, this was a very strong effect for compliance of the law, because the, the first one was not the fine. Because, you know, the, the, the restaurant owner, they had to pay a fine if they had smoking uh, in, 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 in a closed place. But was mo much more important, the, you know, the crowd effect, so the business. And in doing our quick, quick and dirty uh, health impact assessment, we didn't believe this. So we didn't consider that business 
was, was one of the most motivating aspect of the success of the smoking ban. I don't know the other countries. This is something that, yeah. I don't remember in France when was we had the same bill, of course, in France. Uh, after, uh, no, I'm sure I was uh, surprised for Italy, but uh, <laughs> uh, but in France uh, you've got many cafes, people smoking, of course, and the cafes doubled their terraces. The terraces were opened. Now they're closed with another problem because they're just making their heating outside. But they doubled the, the, the space to serve the people because people smoking just stay outside in a covered place, which is a bit outside, inside, and it's outside, and people not smoking inside, really. So they've got a bigger business now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I want to, uh, you know, we, we already made I have 20, 20 minutes. So let, let's go to, to one example I want to present to you. Then, then you will have the, the slide. I want to present you one of example of application because otherwise you may say yeah, you're always speaking of theory, Let, let's do some work. So this is um, a work we did uh, within a project, a European project long ago now, 10 years ago, uh, on waste assessment. So why waste assessment? This is not air pollution. This is the assessment of the process of treating, treating waste in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in specific cities or in specific countries. And uh, so when we did the, um, this assessment, we have tried to do in a sort of integrated way. So, so we said to ourselves, said, let's look all the full chain uh, from waste production to health effects. And this is important because you can see all the different aspects. We would see this in detail. All the different aspects of you know, producing waste, management waste, and, and uh, uh, you know, producing health effects. Let's start here. So the waste production is very much dependent on the society um, uh, decisions. So you have uh, waste production from, from all sectors, not only from households. And uh, you have various, uh, various possibilities to manage waste. You know, waste management starts from, uh, you know, collection and transport, recycling, composting. You have plants with me mechanical and biological treatment. You have, uh, you know, industrial process like uh, gasification and pyrolysis. pyrolysis. You have old styles incinerators. You have landfills. And, and of course, you have also illegal dumping and, and burning. So you have all sorts of possible management. And when you decide your policy about how we manage the waste, you have to specify what you want as a, as a policy maker. Of course, all this process may have some emissions, and you have here a list of potential emissions, including, of course, uh, some gases that may have a global warming effect, but also some dioxin. Think about illegal incineration. You have a lot of dioxin coming out. So you have a lot of different possible exposure, and they go through air, water, and soil, and they can go also th through the food chain. So it's a very complex, and you have exposure of the people from inhalation, ingestion, and dermal contact, and you have a list of possible uh, health effects, and you can calculate the impact uh, 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 as excess cases, dollars, and costs. And of course, in, in making the impact, you have, you have to consider the vul vulnerability of people, not only by age and gender, by previous health sta status, the lifestyle uh, uh, behavior, and socioeconomic status. So this is quite complex. I took one year to develop this graph, okay? So it's not an easy graph. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's quite complex. So we have been trying to address all the issues in this uh, exercise. Part of this, been, this has been published, in, this was published in 2011, I think, in Environmental Health. And we did this assessment in three European countries. And uh, 
this is the effect, this is quite interesting, is the effect of exposure to landfills. You may know that the European U Union decided that landfills with crude, I call crude waste, so untreated waste, waste uh, has been banned in, in the European Union. So you cannot uh, fill a landfill with untreated waste, according to the uh, current law. This was not the, the, uh, this was not the case in 2008 when we did this assessment. So at that time, we said, in each country, we have uh, an annual number of cases of uh, congenital malformation and uh, a number of uh, low birth weight coming from uh, exposure to this landfill. So this was the impact. You may think that this impact in, 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 in comparison to the, you know, if you make this in terms of proportion of the total number of births, this is a trivial number because you think, for instance, Italy, we have, we had in the past 500,000 new births in a year. So 700 is a teeny proportion of this 500,000. This was 2008, now stays, believe, believe it or not, do you know how many b new births we have per year? 400,000. So in 10 years, we decrease the number of births. It's, it's, it's a huge decline. So in terms of proportion, it's, 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 a, teeny, it's a small proportion w that comes with, uh, with some uncertainty, uh, of course. And this was an easy, uh, application of the health impact assessment. Why it's easy? Because you have the exposure, you know, the birth is occur, occur the same year, so there is no time lag. But of course, when you want to estimate the number, the excess cases of cancer, or uh, this is the years of life lost uh, due to, to exposure to PM10 and NO2, you know, the, the number of cases is small here, but when, when we went to the, the issue of cancer, we, we had to uh, go back to this slide, which I think is, is a very interesting slide. I'll try to explain to you. Suppose you have an intervention here at, at time zero, but the exposure to this specific uh, um, exposure condition started uh, in the past. Suppose you are evaluating the effect of incinerators. So the incinerators are old, so they started to accumulate cases from the past, and then at a certain point in time, you decide to make an action like closing the incinerator. You still, you, you will have some new cases which are related to the, to the exposure of the past. So in the future, you still have some cases uh, related to past exposure. And, uh, but of course, if you don't do this action of closing the plants, you, you will have this huge increase in the cases. So the number of cases avoided are this part, this big part, but you still have some cases that uh, will be occurring in any case. So we apply this for the incinerators. So this is the, the estimation of the additional cancer cases near incinerator in Italy. Uh, due to exposure before 2001, we called that past exposure. And, and during a period 2001 to 2020, you see that the number, the large number of cases are due to the past exposure. And only a small fraction is due to the current exposure. So, so if what we are saying is that is there, there is some background number of cases that is occurring in any case, and this, they will be occurring in, in, in the future, and of course this decline is due to the closure of the incinerator. So this, this exercise was very interesting to uh, consider in our health input assessment, not only the cross-sectional design, but also the longitudinal design. You don't want only to assess the effect 
in a specific year, you want to assess the effect in a very long time, uh, um, time span. Do you have a question regarding this? This is a difficult part, so maybe you have comments. Okay, otherwise. I have a question. Yeah, yeah. I. Uh, it was a question from Samane, and she was asking, uh, in all the assessments, uh, we don't use fertility, uh, we haven't used fertility, da uh, fertility uh, data, tables, and the effect of pollutants on incoming newborns, and how their mothers are exposed to the pollution. So she was just wondering uh, if uh, it wasn't concerned in health uh, impact assessment. Yeah, of course, fertility is, is one of the uh, indicators. Unfortunately, the data... Yeah, so unfortunately, the, the database on the effect of uh, uh, some chemicals and some pollutants on, on fertility is not uh, huge. So when we have the issue of, uh, you know, the dose-response relationship, we are in the field of uncertainties of, of what, what kind of uh, uh, estimation take. But of course, fertility is one of the issues because it's very sensitive in the population, it's a very sensitive issue. So, uh, of course, congenital malformation is, is an issue for reproductive health, but also fertility. So, it's a very good point. So, um, uh, so we have been continuing this exercise on, on waste management, and uh, this was very complex exercise, but it's complex as the issue is complex. So, we did this just to show the complexity of the issue of waste management. So at that time, in 2008, we had the, the, this baseline, and, and, and we compared this uh, baseline with a waste strategy that the regional government decided to apply to the waste management in the, in the Lazio region. It's, the Lazio region is where Rome is located. Uh, so this was a, 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 was a specific proposal from the government. Unfortunately, the, gov the government uh, did not last to this point. But, you know, we did this exercise. So this was a proposal for the government. And uh, in addition, we said, okay, these this policy makers, they are green, they want to do green, but let's be extremely green and let's invent a policy which is more radical than the one that uh, uh, the government has uh, already uh, decided. So, so the baseline was, uh, was any waste prevention policy in Lazio? Uh, the baseline was no. Um, the government recommended the waste prevention policy, especially for the industrial waste and packing in the supermarkets. You know, one of the main issues of waste is the packing. That you get your, uh, you know, your cheese, and you get your cheese with a lot of, uh, you know, cartoons and, and so on. So you want to avoid that because that's a waste. So, so the waste prevention was uh, uh, recommended, but as in Italy, if you recommend something and you don't enforce, that's is a lost battle. So we said, if we want to be green, we recommend and enforce. So, uh, so we have to have a sort of uh, uh, aim of uh, decreasing uh, waste production 15% uh, over the baseline. So we had recycling at that time 17%. The government said we, we should go up to almost 60%, and we said, let's do 70%. Uh, the waste collection was mostly by beans and trucks. So, you know, if you have been to, to, to Rome, you have beans everywhere. You have these big trucks collecting from the beans. And the government said, okay, let's go to to a mixed system where we have both beans and trucks, but also door-to-door -door collection. So people going to the specific households and collect the, 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 the garbage. And we said, let's be uh, green and mostly do door-to-door. -door. 
Um, then what about recycling? Um, we had uh, a street collection of glass and paper. Uh, the government said door-to-door -door collection. And uh, what we said, uh, let's have door-to-door -door collection, but also centralized collection of, uh, of uh, uh, at specific recycling centers. This was also a very big change. Uh, diesel trucks were used for collecting uh, waste. And diesel, diesel trucks were very polluting the environment. And only a small proportion was collected by train. So the government said, let's have uh, electric vehicles. And, uh, and we said, let's have electric vehicles, but let's improve also the train uh, use for collecting um, uh, waste. Uh, mechanical and biological treatment for 30% to 100%. Um, uh, and this was a big change. Landfill without pretreatment was, in 2008, 70% of garbage was just to landfill without pretreatment. So the government said, according to European law, 0%. We also said 0%. We increased the number of uh, uh, waste management facilities. Uh, the government said, let's have, uh, uh, you know, what is this? So the government said, we had in the past two incinerators, they got set, the government said four incinerators, and we said two incinerators. Okay, and occupational program improved occupational program. So this was the different scenarios. Of course, the only real one was the baseline. This was a real one because it was demanded by the policy makers, and this was completely invented by the, the, the investigators. So this was a quite important uh, um, achievement of the, of the uh, three scenarios. This is the baseline. You see the trucks circulating all over the, the city. And in, our, in, the, in the government plan, you had much less traffic from, 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 from trucks. And in our green policy, uh, this was decreased again. Um, in terms of uh, uh, occupational injuries, this was one part of the assessment. You know, we had quite high occupational injuries uh, at baseline, but surprise, surprise, we realized that with the government strategy, because we had door-to-door -door collection, so the, the number of uh, occupational in injuries actually increased rather than decreased. Uh, for some reason, I, I forgot why, with our green policy, we were, uh, you know, decreasing that. But the most important was this one. This is, uh, we decide to have the evaluate the impact as disability adjusted life years, and you have this baseline scenario, and you, you have, from this baseline, you have a large part due to transport, uh, then a good part from uh, uh, mechanical and biological treatment is actually a small part from incinerators and a large part from landfills. With the uh, waste strategy from the government, we actually decreased a lot the contribution from transport, whereas for, from the landfill, still we had some large impact and in our green policy, we were able also to, to decrease the impact from landfill. So you see, this was a nice way to synthesize, the, to make a synthesis of all the possible impacts. And at this stage, we took the DALI. Why we took the DALI? Why the disability adjusted life years was the, the, uh, in the estimate of choice? because you can use different outcomes and convert them into a single uh, uh, number. Uh, I'm just finished, yeah. Uh, into a single number. That's why this was an easy way to, to, to finish. So I have uh, maybe the last, 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 last slide. You can keep this. <laughs> this was, I was challenged by the 
the one hour and 15. Okay. 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 We, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I was scared. <laughs> Uh, so, health impact assessment has long tradition, not always uh, well appreciated, especially from epidemiologists. And one of the slides that I skipped was a discussion that uh, um, David Saritz, who is a famous epidemiologist, made, uh, it was an editorial in, in epidemiology last year, uh, uh, just claiming that epidemiologic studies, in many cases, cases are not useful, are even dangerous, if we can respond to the policy question with health impact assessment. So if you can respond to with health impact assessment, don't do epidemiological studies because they may be too long to, to provide answers and may, the response may be less uncertain than uh, applying the health impact assessment. Uh, health impact assessment can be conducted to address several complex issues and waste management is one of the complex issues. It's very complicated and very uh, uh, urgent for policy maker, makers. Uh, health impact assessment is quicker than local epidemiological studies and I have the last stakeholders involvement is difficult. Why is difficult? because stakeholders have different views. And these different views are many times very conflicting. You know, if you have the proponent of a plant, of a project, and you have a community people, you are sure that you will see people fighting. So the most important part is how to do the stakeholder involvement in our health input assessment. And we tend to rely on journalists and what they say. <laughs> okay, with this I finish. <laughs> Thank you.